Hi, I'm really glad to be here. I've been sitting right here on the front row uh, and taking in what you're saying. And Shel Magna, thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you. I want to, I do want to acknowledge that as I've been watching people here, that this has been a very white group. And uh, I just want you to know that 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 is striking to me. And I'm sorry I'm so white right now. <laughs> and I actually had um, a film that I wanted to bring to you, uh, uh, about a five-minute clip uh, from a, a film that you should see called Iron Ladies of Liberia since Ellen Johnson Sirleaf won the Nobel Peace Prize. I assume you've all seen Pray the Devil Back to Hell, which is Lim Gaboy. Uh, but do see Iron Ladies of Liberia. You can find it on YouTube. And, and there's a wonderful piece where, where Ellen Johnson Sirleaf goes to the Firestone Rubber Company and she demands what is right for the employees. As, and she does that as part of the peace stabilization in that post-conflict time. So uh, think of me, not as me, if you will. Think of me in terms of the probably thousand plus women leaders with whom I've worked and very few of them have skin that looks like mine. Okay. Um, I am particularly appreciative of the themes that have uh, been launched here today and the idea that uh, Ingrid Stanga was saying at the very beginning about how closely linked these issues are because I work on one sliver with a laser focus and that is the role of women as leaders in conflict areas. I don't work with the issue of women as victims and the reason I don't is not because I don't care, but if you get women into leadership, they will tend to be much more active in addressing the women as victims piece. And by the way, whenever you're talking about this with people, um, if you start out with women ought to be at the table, you know, at, in negotiations or whatever, uh, because they are so many of the victims, uh, you, ha you start out with these women as, as very weak. And so I, I just would say, don't go there. You don't need to go there. Uh, if you start out by saying, women should be at the table because we need women's rights. You know what? The, whoever you're talking to already knows that. They already know about women's rights. If that was going to be the decisive argument, it would have already happened. So then you have to say, well, well what am I going to convince people of? Because... You know, I, I'm sure, that, you know, that, as has been mentioned, the number of women, for example, in negotiations is minuscule. Just, it's almost insignificant. And then 60% of the peace agreements, do you all know this stat? 60% of them fail within five years. Now, how does that happen? Okay, so here I am. Imagine me. I'm the U.S. ambassador in Austria. And there's a three-way war going on in Yugoslavia, and it is brutal. There are concentration camps. There are rape camps. Be sure and see Angelina Jolie's new film, In the Land of Blood and Honey. It is as true as can be. So it is god-awful. There, there's been nothing like it in Europe for 50 years since the whole Nazi movement. And I'm right there at this big desk. I'm the last dropping off point before you go into hell. So I have the challenge of hosting negotiations in 1994. It's a three-way war. We need to turn it into a two-way war. Let's get two of the sides together so they can face off against the real aggressors, which was the Serbs. All right. So we have two rounds of negotiations, one for eight days, another for six days. We succeed, we get an agreement, we get lines drawn, there are these maps spread out all over my desk. We go to the White House for the signing, and it's, a, it's an audience like this, an auditorium, and out comes President Clinton, President Izabegovich, and Pre Pre President Tuchman. Okay, and they stand there, and there's this long table. And I'm sitting right there where you are, and I, you know, look around the auditorium, and do you know what I see? 
it's a sea of green, excuse me, a sea of gray suits. And I thought, holy shit, how did this happen? I hadn't noticed it, and I was the host. I was the host of the talks. And it never dawned on me. I had worked on women's rights and women's organizing and all of that before I became ambassador. I didn't see it. Now, the peace agreement that we came up with was not great at all. The peace agreement at Dayton, which was lauded as being so fabulous to stop the war, it froze the hardliners in power. There was not one woman at the Dayton agreements. Now, I'm one of the good guys. Dick Holbrook, who led the Dayton talks, he's one of the good guys. We are enlightened. We are progressive. But we weren't looking at it through a gender lens. It didn't dawn on us that that would be an issue. I was thinking, oh, I'm in the world of international security. I know what that looks like. Shoulders like this, you know, suits like that. So we have to really change our mindsets. We have to like throw them in disarray and see what we come out with. And you know what you come out with? You come out with some spectacular examples of what women do to break that vicious circle of we have a pre-conflict situation that goes into war and then you get this post-conflict. And guess what? The post-conflict is usually a pre-conflict. It just spirals round and round. So how do women get in there and break that up? Well, with the thousand women I've been working with, we've been doing you know, histories, recordings, videos, isolating what they do. I'm going to give you just a few examples. They have their fingers on the pulse of the community. Viosa de Bruna, when she was named uh, right after the Kosovo uh, what shall I say, the, the war where we came in and we did the bombing and they, they fled the big exodus and then they come back in. You, do you remember that? <laughs> in about 99. Anyway, Viosa de Bruna was named. You, you be the Minister for Civil Society and uh, let's see, that includes independent media and uh, elections. And like, she was a physician. She, was a, she went into her office that the UN gave her. There was not a desk. There was no telephone. And how is she supposed to build this whole civil society? So she said, oh, it was okay. I, I, there was a cafe across the street, and I had my cell phone. And I said, that's horrible. She said, no, no, it was perfect, because people could come talk to me. And, and then I, we set up these forums all over. And because I knew the languages, I, I just kept talking to people and getting their ideas. And, you know, she created something that was spectacular out of her willingness to be there and, and to have access. And when women have access, it makes such a difference. Another woman in Palestine, a professor, Sumaya, told me that it was a, there were some Israeli soldiers, young guys, they were going crazy. They were down at an intersection. They were shooting up the place. She saw it from her window. She came running down. She ran up to these guys and said, stop it because there were four little children over here who were screaming and holding on to each other. They were so scared because they had to get through the intersection to get home. And she said, stop it and let those children get through. And the guy's like, the children run across and then she went right back up to the guy and she said, look at me, look me in the eyes. I am your mother. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine if she had been a man, he would have been killed instantly. So there is a huge value in bringing these women in. And they have such a force of healing. After the genocide in Rwanda, Inyumba, Aloysia Inyumba was named the Minister for Gender and Families. First thing she did, she had 500,000 orphans. 500,000 orphans. Okay? there were about seven million people left. A tenth of the population had been murdered. So she said, I have to do something with these kids. How many children do you have? Two. You have three now. How many do you have? Three. You have four now. She just, that's what she did. She just handed them off. 
I mean, and she said, I lay at night thinking, what have I done? I mean, th come on, you all. This is the equivalent of, you know, immediately post-World War II uh, taking, taking Jewish babies and handing them off to German families. Just, you know, you, you've got to do this. Better to have them in someone's family. Yeah, I mean, it, it, extraordinary. She said... Um, then she was named the head of unity and reconciliation. She went village to village to village to village. She had the villagers uh, make up songs about what had happened to them. She had them make up plays, just anything that would help them, them get it out. And you all, the world is filled with these magnificent women. And it's, it's just like, um, it's just like was said earlier by Janet. We've got to get them into the positions of power. That's what will make the difference. It's not that they need training, you know? I mean, sure, you, you know, we work with them a lot about how do you deliver the message in a way that the policymakers can hear. But these women, they are the experts, and they're magnificent. And so that's what I do with, with this Institute for Inclusive Security. We work with about 6,000 policymakers to... Connect them with these women who will show them the way. And so let me close now and uh, tell you in, in passing about one more person. We've been mentioning the Nobel Peace Prize a lot here. You will recall that Jane Addams won the Nobel Peace Prize, a woman, an American woman, who had created what was called the hospitality movement, working with immigrants, again, trying to stabilize the situation. And they were homeless, and she set up all across our country these hospitality houses. Fabulous woman. Well, look, she did die, and uh, this, because this was, I'm going to guess, the early 1800s. She died, and um, when she actually was at the gates, uh, Peter said to her, you won the Nobel Peace Prize. You have lived an extraordinary life. And what we do for people like you when you reach this point is you get an interview with anyone in heaven that you would like. It is a special, it is a special dispensation. So it didn't take her a nanosecond. She said, I know I need to speak to the Blessed Virgin. And Peter said, ay, 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 there's a long line. Uh, she said, I'll wait. Okay. So finally the moment came. And she had her audience with Mary. And when she went in, she said, I, I will not keep you. I know there is a very, very, very long line of people who want to speak to you. I have only one question. And Mary said, yes. And she said, I, I have been such a lover of art. And I go into museums, I go into cathedrals, and I see statues of you. I see bas-relief. I see paintings. And whether it's just you by yourself, or you with the angel, or especially the ones of you holding the Christ child. There is a gentleness in your face, but there is a, a wistfulness. It's almost a sadness that I see in your face. And what, why isn't there joy? Why isn't there excitement? You know, this is the savior of the world. Where? And Mary said, I've never been asked this before. And she looked around, and they were alone. And she said, you're really going to have to not repeat this. But we were really hoping for a girl. So <laughs> thank you for... <laughs>